There have been 2,272 MLB players so far, which is roughly the population of Lebanon, Ohio. So being in the MLB is kind of like living in a small town where everyone knows your name and is in Ohio, except this town keeps changing, very rapidly in fact. People might have known who you are back in the day, but now, with so many arrivals year after year, so many names to keep track of, it's almost like you never existed. Ohio talk aside, the rule of thumb used to be that it took about 7 to 10 years for a thousand players to make their major league debut, but that began to change a few years ago. Now, a thousand players debut in the bigs every four or five seasons. For context, Albert Pujols was the 15,242nd player to appear on an MLB roster on April 2, 2001. Since then, he's played against 25% of the total players ever to appear in the big leagues. One reason the Hall of Fame is so important is that it serves the bulwark against the erosion of memory. The greats won't be forgotten, the sands of time won't bury legends, and fans can celebrate the enduring accomplishments of the 341 superstars who are enshrined in Cooperstown today. That's right, just 1.7 of MLB players have been elected to the Hall. But what about the 98.3% who've been condemned to languish in our fading recollection? Can we just let them drift away into oblivion? Shouldn't we try to honor some excellent players who don't deserve to be sucked up by the vacuum cleaner of history? That's why today we're going to be looking at players who were just too good to be forgotten, beginning with those with the lowest R war up to those with the highest. So without further ado, let's do our best to try to immortalize some of these gems in the rough that definitely don't deserve to be forgotten. But before we get more into that, I want to take a moment to shout out today's sponsor, HelloFresh. As someone who's personally used this service many times in the past, I can say that HelloFresh makes eating affordable, high quality food easier than ever before. Not only do the raw, fresh ingredients travel from the farm to you in less than 7 days, ensuring freshness, but they also come with a detailed instruction slip that guarantees you'll have all the tools necessary to prepare your food in the most delicious way possible. On top of that, the sheer amount of diversity in their meal options is staggering, ranging from falafel power bowls to seared steak and potatoes with Bernays sauce to southwest pork and bean burritos. HelloFresh is also cheaper than many grocery shopping options for similar items, and on average, 25% cheaper than takeout. Here we are preparing our very own meal of chicken and bacon filled ravioli with mushrooms. As you can see, the process couldn't be simpler, and hey, trust me, if two college age students with zero cooking experience can make something that tastes this good, you know the service has to be effective. So, what are you waiting for? Go to HelloFresh.com and use code MTC21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. You can also click the link in the description and pin comment as well. Again, go to HelloFresh.com and use code MTC21 for 21 free meals and free shipping. Now, back to our video. First step, Troy Gloss with the career R war of 38.1. Real quick, let me give you a quiz. Who had the most home runs by the age of 24 out of these players? Nolan Arenado, Jordan Alvarez, Mark McGuire, or Troy Glaus? Okay, we pretty much gave away the answer. It's Troy Glaus, who slugged 118 round trippers by the time he turned 25. But that's not completely shocking, since Glaus won a home run title at the age of 23, when he belted 47 homers in 2000 while playing for the Los Angeles Angels. The first thing you have to understand about Troy Glaus is his size. In the summer before 9th grade, he went from 5'6 to 6'2, a growth so rapid that he had to have surgeries on both knees. He would eventually check in at 6'5, 240 pounds by the end of his senior season. By then, he'd been pegged as a can't-miss power prospect. Glaus got drafted in the second round in the 1994 draft, 37th overall by the San Diego Padres. But Glaus was worried that the pods were in the midst of a fire sale, so he didn't end up signing. He would end up going third overall in 1997 after smashing the Pac-10 to absolute smithereens. He broke Mark McGuire's single-season home run record with 34, a record that still stands today. The Angels moved Glaus to third base, and they were so high in his talents that he he only spent 106 games in the minors before he got his call to the show. It may have been a little rushed. During his first 185 plate appearances in 1998, he hit exactly one homer while whiffing 51 times. But by the end of 1999, he'd become a fixture at third for the Halos, belting 29 homers while batting 240. It would be in the year 2000 that changed everything for Troy. As we mentioned before, he became a home run champ with 47 dingers, along with a more robust 284 batting average and an OPS plus of 150, a number even more impressive when considering this was at the height of the steroid era. He went to the All-Star Game and won a Silver Slugger. 
The following year, Glaus went back to back with 40 homer seasons, dropping 41 bombs while driving in 108. And then in 2002, Glaus burnished his legend even more. The Angels finished 99 and 63 and got a wild card into the playoffs, which they then parlayed into a World Series championship. All Glaus did was bat 385 with three homers and eight RBIs and win the series MVP. His Game 6 heroics, when his double put the Angels ahead after being down five runs, were legendary. Things would never again be so good for Glaus, however. He missed time in 2003 and 2004 with injuries, putting up subpar seasons, and then signed as a free agent with the Diamondbacks in 2005. From here, he would go on to play with three more teams over the next five years, having a couple good seasons in there, but nothing like his 2000 to 2001 heyday. His defensive numbers at third base would slip as well, eventually pushing him over to first in his final campaign. With 320 homers and a career OPS plus of 119 over just 13 seasons, only 8 of which he played in more than 120 games, Glaus proved that when he was healthy, he was one of the most productive power hitters in the game. If only he could have stayed healthy. Carlos Zambrano at 38.3 Mr. Zambrano was another very large human, coming in at 6'4 and 275 pounds, with an attitude to match. In the dugout, he could be a terror, but on the field, he was just as much of a problem. Mostly, Zambrano was the antithesis of Mark Pryor and Kerry Wood, the two flamethrowing phenoms that the Cubs have been counting on to be mainstays of their rotation. Sadly, both would flame out after promising starts to their careers, done in by torn UCLs and extensive overthrowing, both innings and max effort. Both had electric stuff. Zambrano, however, despite being gigantic, sat around 88 to 92 with a sinker that routinely sawed off hitters' bats. Sure, he could run his four seamer into the mid 90s, but along with his nasty slider, he didn't have much of a reason to be constantly trying to blow it past hitters. And this approach, for much of the 2000s, worked well for Zambrano. Between 2003 and 2010, El Toro averaged 10.2 wins per season, with a high of 18 in 2007. The year before, in 2006, he'd become the first Venezuelan-born player to lead the league in wins, with 16. Yeah, yeah, wins are stats that only dumb people care about, but Zambrano didn't need outdated stats to be considered elite. For example, from 2003 to 2006, Zambrano's ERA Plus never dipped below 135, and for his entire career, averaged 120. Stats don't necessarily convey the pure majesty of Zambrano's game. Today, Shohei Otani throws harder than almost every pitcher, and hits the ball harder than almost everyone not named Stanton, Judge, or Cruz. He is rightly lauded as a unicorn, but Zambrano was doing his version of Otani before social media blew up. Back when El Toro was playing, pitchers pitched and hitters hit, yet Zambrano's bat was hard to ignore. While the Cubs, the team he played for for most of his career, didn't let him DH the few times they played AL competition, they did send him up to the plate to pinch hit 20 odd times in his career. Because the man could, quite simply, rake. Three times, he won a Silver Slugger award. In 693 career ABs, he crushed 24 homers and drove in 71, with an OPS plus of 62, meaning that he, as a pitcher hitting every five days, somehow managed to be over half as good as a regular hitter in the lineup. His career home run percentage was a staggering 3.2%, well above the MLB average of 2.7%, on top of his career war at the plate being a positive number, at 5.6 overall. Chuck Knobloch, 44.6. Sometimes it's a serious injury that derails the career of an immensely talented player, and sometimes, for reasons only Sigmund Freud could understand, it's a mental block that blows out the tires. For any MLB player, the most haunting mental disease to come down with is the dreaded yips. Steve Sachs, whose promising career was almost destroyed by a bizarre inability to throw to first, was the most famous victim of the issue in its infancy, though John Lester, Daniel Bard, and Rick Ankeel have all suffered some form of it since. What brought the issue into the limelight was that for three years in the early 80s, Sachs sprayed the ball like he was shooting a t-shirt bazooka into the crowd. Somehow, he managed to get over it after that and stayed in the bigs for 12 seasons. Enter Chuck Knobloch. Like Sachs, Knobloch played second and was named Rookie of the Year. Like Sachs, Knobloch was a speedy leadoff hitter who could steal bases. But Knobloch was a much better player than Sachs overall, as he could hit for a higher average, something that was valued very highly at the time and was considered a plus defender who, in 1997, won a gold glove for his exceptional work in the field. During his run with the Twins, Chuck put up gaudy numbers. In 1996, he had a monster year, batting 341 while leading the league in triples. For three straight seasons, he finished in the top 20 for the league MVP. He seemed destined to be a legendary leadoff hitter, as he had some decent pop, could swipe 60 bases, draw 100 walks, and play flawless D at second. He had a ring from the 1991 Twins Championship, and in 1998, he joined a Yankees team that was just about to start a World Series 3 peat. Knobloch was entering the prime of his career, ready to claim his place as one of the best of all time in his position. But then came the yips. 
and it made no sense. By 1998, Knobloch was the kind of fielder who might commit 10 errors in a season, often less. The Twins, for one, had no problem playing him at short at times. But for whatever reason, when he joined the Yankees, he couldn't make easy throws to first base. 98 saw him make 13 errors, the most since his rookie year. Then, 1999 rolled around, and the nightmare really started. His errors doubled to 26, mostly on throws. Some he lobbed, some he fired. It didn't matter. The apex of his struggles was a game against the White Sox on June 15, 2000. Noblock committed three errors in six innings, all on throws, and in the middle of the sixth inning, Noblock asked to be taken out of the game, after which he left Yankee Stadium entirely before the contest was even over, changing into street clothes while the Yankees got clobbered 12-3. His war had fallen all the way from 8.7 in 1996 to 0 0.3 in 2000, a truly heartbreaking decline, and one of the steepest and most random of all time. Whenever the Yankees returned to Minnesota, the fans booed him and threw objects at his head. Noblock turned dark, saying he'd take it to the house if he couldn't fix his throwing issues, whatever that meant. He would retire in 2002 after a poor year with the Royals at just 33 years old, a victim to one of the weirdest and most random conditions any player can have the misfortune of grappling with. When you think of the best pitchers of the 1990s, these names probably come to mind. Greg Maddox, Randy Johnson, Roger Clemens, David Cohn, and Kevin Appier. Oh, you didn't think of Kevin Appier. Not many people do, it turns out, but Appier is one of only five pitchers who logged over 1,800 innings with an ERA plus of 130 or more in the 1990s. We told you who the other four were. All of them won a Cy Young or two or three or six, and Maddox and Johnson are in Cooperstown. The best Appier ever finished was third in the Cy Young balloting in 1993 when he led the league in ERA, ERA plus, and home runs allowed per nine innings. Appier had the superior numbers to the eventual winner, Jack McDowell of the White Sox, with an ERA plus of over 40 points higher. But since McDowell had won 22 games to Kevin's 18, Appier didn't get the support he deserved. In today's world, he would have been a unanimous choice. The problem was, Appier played on some really bad Kansas City teams. The most they ever won during his tenure was 84 games. It was so bad that somehow, as dominant as Kevin was in 1993, he didn't even make the all-star team. Typical for Appier was a year like 1996, when he went 14-11, and 11, which seemed pretty pedestrian at the time. He again didn't make the all-star team and got zero votes for the Cy Young. Yet, that year, Appier led the American League in fielding independent pitching, put up another elite ERI plus of 137, and struck out over 200 batters. Not even an all-star nod? Seriously? Appier toiled on the mound during the height of the steroids era, and yet always seemed to excel, putting up an ERA plus of over 120 every year from 1990 to 1997. And he was tough. Really tough. As even after a torn labrum in 1998, which robbed him of some velo, he still kept grinding for another seven seasons. He retired at the end of 2004, finishing his career with seven times he had placed in the top 10 for war in a season, and yet only a single career all-star nod. Cesar Cedinho, 52.9. For much of his early career, Cesar Cedinho looked like a lock for Cooperstown. He came up at 19 out of the Dominican Republic and hit 310 with the speed to steal bases at will and a glove in center that rivaled some of the game's greatest. The next year, he cracked 40 doubles to lead the league and followed that with 39 the following season. By the time Cesar Cedinho was 22, he'd won two gold gloves in center and had swiped 50 bases twice. His power had increased from 7 homers in a season to 25. Speed, power, a high average, and a truly golden glove. There was an obvious comp, and a baseball legend decided to call it out. The iconic Leo DeRocher, who was Cedinho's manager in Houston, said that Cedinho had a chance to be as good as Willie Mays. The same DeRocher who had managed Mays in New York and San Fran, and the same Willie Mays who between 1954 to 1966 had racked up a war of 124.1, 27.7 more than any other player during that span. So, Cedinho seemed to be destined to be included in conversations that centered on the best ever, not simply if he would be a Hall of Famer, period. After all, when you're 21 and put up an OPS plus of 162, and then as an encore roll out of 152, at a time when many of your peers are just getting to AAA, it's hard not to dream big. But two things robbed Cedinho of being sanctified in Cooperstown. One was a horrific off-the-field incident that left a woman shot dead and Cedinho in jail serving 20 days on an involuntary manslaughter charge. The details are gruesome, but a quick recap is that Cedinho claimed that a woman had been curious about his gun and had accidentally shot herself in the temple. Very 
perceptive teammates like Bob Watson, who became the first black GM in Major League Baseball history, said that Cedeno was never the same hitter because he changed his swing to hit homers in order to make everyone forget about the incident. Perhaps. In the three years after the shooting, however, Cedeno won two gold gloves and averaged an OPS plus of 130.8, slightly down from his best, but Cedeno was still a big threat to run and stole more than 50 bases every year from 1972 to 1977. He was an extremely valuable player during this time. So I mean, Watson could be right, because Cedeno's batting average stayed below 300 after the shooting except for one season, but I think the second reason is probably more likely as to what made Cedeno become a footnote. He got hurt and he got hurt a lot. In 1978, he tore a knee ligament. The next season, he came down with hepatitis. Then, in 1980, during the NLCS, he broke an ankle. That injury almost single-handedly robbed him of his speed and his elite center field defense. Unfortunately, during his 17 seasons, Cedinho would only be able to play over 100 games in a season 12 times. He finished short of many of the MLE milestones one needs to be considered for Cooperstown, including 200 home runs, 1,000 RBIs, and 2,500 hits, all of which at the time meant even more devotion than they do today. Being swept into the dustbin of history must hurt for players who excelled at a high level. One day you're being compared to Willie Mays, and the next you're a trivia question at a sports bar. That's why one of the best parts of making baseball content is to unearth hidden gems who, for one reason or another, didn't garner the lasting attention that their talents merited. Using new age analytics to realize just how awesome someone like Kevin Appier really was feels like a revelation. But this list isn't the last word. We'll let you have that. In the comments, tell us who you think deserves to be rescued from the depths of baseball's abyss. Who in your mind was too good to be forgotten? Who knows, maybe I'll even make a part two. Thanks for watching, and make sure to like and subscribe for more. Check out this playlist for more essay videos just like these, and have a great day everyone.